Thursday weekly talk show. Your host here, Mike Callahan, with Dylan Rothenberg of the Simple Grow team. Um, Dylan, we're coming into the fall here, and a lot of people have been asking on the Service Autopilot Facebook group, Simple Growth Facebook group, and everywhere else in between, how do we get Service Autopilot set up for proper snow removal, job costing, scheduling, and everything else? So uh, right now, we're coming up to the end of October. If you haven't got those contract renewals out there, uh, it's time to get them out there. We used to start renewing those, those snow removal contracts in our company, uh, Callahan's Lawn Care, uh, beginning at, beginning in the middle of July, believe it or not, almost fully booked pretty much by this time. Uh, we were a little bit opposite of Dylan uh, up north of the border in Sudbury, Canada, um, before Dylan sold his business. I'll let him uh, give a little feedback about that before we dive into service autopilot and kind of lift the hood and really show you what a multi-million dollar snow operation looks like running on service autopilot with a complete setup. But uh, background on myself, the snow removal business, um, columnist for Snow Magazine, as well as Lawn and Landscape Magazine behind here, Callahan's Corner, talking about literally snow removal and processes. Uh, and Dylan, when we went out, we plowed about 180 acres of pavement, believe it or not, between residential and commercial. So it was uh, an organized three ring circus without having the software set up for scheduling billing and um, job cost tracking would have never happened. Um, so if you want to give a little background on uh, Maxim Lawn Care and being first to market with the inverted snowblower tractors that you had uh, well before the, the bleeding edge of it, at least in the States. Um, and then we'll open up the screen and, and dive in SA and you're going to show us uh, how you can actually use service autopilot to run your snow removal, whether it's plows, tractors, or anything in between. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we plowed 180 acres of uh, parking lot, that's for sure. But um, back a couple of years back, I had a company, um, and we were actually about 75% snow removal, uh, 25% lawn. So mm -hmm. not a typical mix. Typically you see more lawn than snow, but being about four hours North of Toronto, we got our fair, fair share of snow. Um, yeah, we, we had quite a bit of commercial work, but we actually primarily were focused on the residential market, uh, right before I sold, I think we were doing about a thousand driveways which a lot of people probably think that would be a major, major headache. But the way that we did it was a little unique and it's becoming more and more prevalent now. Uh, but we basically, like Mike said, we had inverted um, snowblowers on our tractors. And it was actually really interesting because when we started offering that service, that's when our company basically exploded in a good way. Um, before that, we had just kind of nice steady growth and I think it was maybe in 2016 or 2017, we started offering the service and it was just like a great product market fit. Uh, the first year we had one tractor, uh, which typically can do about a hundred driveways, give or take. Um, the second year we had, I think seven tractors. And then the third year after that, I think we were up to 12 tractors just on the residential side. We did some residential plowing as well, uh, but that like explosive growth attracted the interest of a a uh, local competitor, and he ended up buying out our company, which was fairly unique for a small town in, in Northern Ontario. Um, so that's my background. But as Mike said, we were hoping to kind of break down how a company should be properly set up in Surface Autopilot. Um, it's a very popular software, both on the residential and commercial side for snow removal. And it's a great software, very customizable. There's definitely a right way and a wrong way to do it. So we are going to break that down a little bit for you today. All right. So that for a delay, I will uh, see if I get this up on our screen here. And uh, yeah, 1,000 driveways. We had some local guys doing that as well. Um, I think you weathered the storm a little bit better than me. My receding hairline is probably a direct result of the 600 residential driveways that we had. So um, totally get it, brother. Totally get it. So here we go. We've got it. Uh, you can see a little little white in there, I think. Yeah, just, just, just a little bit. Let me see if I can arrange this here so I can... Uh, that's as good as we're going to get. So we'll see what happens. All okay. right. So we've got service autopilot down on the right, it looks like. And uh, how do we set this up for a snow removal company? What are we looking at here, Dylan? Yeah. So this is a demo uh, client account. And you, you'll see that there's like some jobs and, and things on that, um, things already on the account. Because I've used this account once or twice before as a, uh, as a demo. But just picture this as a blank account. A commercial company has contacted you, Mike and they're asking you for a snow removal bid. They're relying on you as the expert, so you gotta basically come to them and tell them what you recommend for their particular property. 
So I'm assuming when that happened to you, Mike, um, would you go out to the property or would, would your first instinct, okay, I'm going to measure this thing and see kind of what we're, what we're working with. Sounds like a loaded question, but no, uh, definitely probably within a year or two years using service autopilot and get it set up. We, uh, predominantly did not do any in-person estimates unless we had to actually get an RFP with a walk around. So, uh, we would traditionally go into the mapping feature and, and measure that out. Yeah. And that's kind of what we uh, eventually got to as well, where if we were going to go meet the person to seal the deal, we would definitely go meet them in person or if it was a really intricate property. But for these kind of cookie cutter commercials, like the one I'm about to show you, um, probably not even worth your time to go out to the property. You kind of want to be the first one to be able to get that estimate out. So in order to be able to do that, you definitely want to be measuring virtually. So the first thing I would always do um, when I when I would get a new quote request in in service autopilot once the client account was actually made like this would be going into the property measurements up here under more and I've got some old uh, turf measurements already in here so I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and go to the satellite view and this was actually where our first shop was in this little kind of uh, commercial building but we did actually plow the parking lot here as well so first things first is we actually just got to take a quick measurement of the parking lot and I'm not going to do it perfectly. I'll just kind of do it nice and quick, but it's very, very simple to just kind of click around and you can get as intricate as you want with it. Yeah. Traditionally that's, it's coming out per thousand square feet. So if you're a hundred square foot off here or there, it's not going to kill you, uh, especially on the parking lots is what we found. Sidewalks, you might want to zoom in a little bit and kind of twist the angle, but. It, yeah, exactly. And if I was actually doing this for like a proper bid, I would definitely be, be zooming in a little bit more and getting it pretty exact. But there was a, uh, a road here, but it was like the last road ever plowed in the city. So in order for people to actually get up here to be able to go to work, uh, they actually expected us to plow, not the entire road, but basically down to about here. Which worked out pretty good for us because our employees had to get out in the morning as well. Okay, so that's the quick lot measurement right there. And on the more com uh, intricate commercial quotes that we would do, we would actually kind of color them a little bit. So we might color that blue to signify something about winter, <laughs> maybe some, some ice or hopefully lack there of ice on the uh, parking lot. But the next thing that we had to measure, because this was like a full service lot, was the side. I'll name this one sidewalk and then I'll zoom in. Actually, I'll make this full screen and I'll zoom in a bit for this one. So in this particular case, I know this property pretty well. We didn't have to do the entire sidewalk here. So we kind of just did from about right here. And it actually, there was like little entranceways all along the side of the building. So if you were actually quoting this and you didn't know about the property, you might want to kind of tilt the map and do a, a 360 view of the property to, to find all these entrances until you have a good uh, understanding of the property. Yeah, very similar. We did uh, Coca-Cola bottling plant. It was about 22, 20 or 22 acres of pavement. Uh, very similar setup, a bit bigger, but that was uh, with that map view, you could actually spin it and actually get a good idea of where it was is. So when you walked in, you, you had a pretty good idea what was going on. Yeah, and like like you said, you could be a little bit more forgiving with the parking lot, but on this, like you definitely want to make sure you don't miss a sidewalk or something like that, and then it ends up resulting in like you know an extra 20, 20 minutes with the sidewalk crew. Yeah, traditionally a pro tip too is we look at as a lot of times we work with service autopilot clients setting these up. Um, the normal bag of ice melt or calcium chloride mix is twelve hundred to fifteen hundred 1,500 square feet. So a lot of times we'll break it up into – 12 to 1500 square feet increments as well. So it gives you a little forgiveness from the map as well. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. And there was a little entranceway down here. So I'll quickly measure that out. So the other thing that while Dylan's doing this too, is if you're looking at your top 100 list and you're going to grow out and scale the additional properties, we uh, would grab the top 100 clients in a certain geographic area and actually measure these out like this and send non-solicited uh, quotes as well with a screenshot marked up a little bit from this. So uh, kind of set yourself away, apart from the competition. But I mean, Dylan, you've just done a bid that if you were to wheel this out, I would I would fair to bet not including drive time would probably be at least an hour to put together. And you've done this, what, in about four minutes, maybe five? 
Yeah, and I said like it's it's a benefit to get the quote out first, um, but you don't want to rush and get a sloppy quote out. But there's something about the professionalness of like being able to get a, a bid in and just know your numbers so well that within a day at the most, you have that quote out to them. And if you include this satellite image in the quote, I mean, it's almost a done deal when they see kind of what you did to actually prepare the quote and you're not just basically pulling a number out of your hat. Yeah. And if, if there is some instructions for parking lots, probably not going to have it, but uh, we were known to pull into the parking lot if we had to and actually measure from Maps Pro uh, right inside the software while we're sitting there just to get it um, a little more accurate. Uh, but I mean, as you can see, a lot of tree coverage, parking lots, things like that are going to show up nicely. But if you're doing landscape maintenance, that's another trick that we've seen with some bigger properties to get an eye on it and actually do it from the truck. Yep. So I've taken the measurement now, but there's one last step in order to be able to actually quote this out. And you got to tell the system what you just measured because it doesn't really know if we're talking about lawns, driveways, parking lots, like what did we actually just measure? So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to hit parking lot square feet. And I'm going to select the measurement here, which is like 83,000, basically 84,000 square feet. So about two acres, maybe a little less. It's impressive, my fellow Canadian. I thought it would be square meters. No, nope, no. Nope. There's, there's certain things that even Canadians like to do the uh, the American way. Um, then the next one here is sidewalk square fit, footage. But because we have two measurements here, you actually... Um, probably a couple different ways to do it but i will actually just exclude the lot measurement so and if i understand correctly you're, you're able to actually pull out islands in a parking lot or add multiple pieces of property all in one shot then is that correct yeah and a lot of people that don't use service autopilot are really impressed by that you could take a thousand different island measurements and have them all total up here um, just with like the core functionality of this measuring tool so it's not just like you're going to google maps and measuring out the the area square feet, it's actually fairly sophisticated. So basically what that means is the sidewalks here, these total up to 3,072 uh, square feet. So I'm gonna save that here. And basically we have all the measurements now that we need to produce this commercial quote. Um, so I'm gonna actually close this out and I'm gonna pull up an estimate. Now there's a ton of background work that actually goes into getting this estimate to pull up the proper rates, budgeted hours, budgeted cost, and things like that. And we definitely help people with that. I'll give like a really, really quick example here, but this is like some of the stuff that we go through when we're getting someone properly set up is we go through their entire financial break even, their labor burden, and some of their equipment costs as well. You need all that information to be able to accurately tell the system, what is my true cost to send someone out there to go plow this parking lot? Otherwise you're typically just, just kind of guessing and the quotes might be good and profitable, but it's gonna be a little harder to actually detect that in the system. So Dylan, if I'm understanding you right, if you, if you get these numbers in here, uh, labor and labor burden, break even costs, uh, desired dollar per hour charge or revenue per man hour or truck, um, the ability in service autopilot, uh, if you actually log in their payroll costs and their direct labor burden, uh, there is automated reports now that you can go in and figure out your direct cost, labor and labor burden on site and your non-billable drive time. So there's going to be some, some clues in there. If you're hitting your budget at times, it looks like you're making the money you should. And at the end of the year, you're not hitting your numbers, uh, profit wise. Those are some automated reports that actually pull all that information right out of service autopilot. Um, and it gives you that clarity and, and there's not many other softwares I know of, if any, uh, they give you the granularity to actually be able to pull that kind of data out, uh, not emotionally, to actually job cost those jobs and actually have real time um, things. And I know Dylan, uh, we are actually first time uh, plucking you out of the out of Canada into the states here coming up. Uh, we're going to be at the Service Edge Conference uh, hosted by Service Autopilot um, November fifteenth through the eighteenth, and we're actually going to be there speaking at the conference as well as a booth. Um, so if anybody is watching this and you actually have some questions. Uh, specifically around this, we'll be around to answer those questions at the conference as well. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to that. That'll be my first time in the, uh, the state of Texas. That'll be great. Um, so I, I skipped ahead one step here. I basically just clicked add an estimate, and this is going to pop up this estimate screen. So I kind of tell people like, 
if you're doing a quote and you're commonly quoting the same things, you don't really want to have to add them line item by line item like you would maybe in QuickBooks or Jobber or, or something like that, right? It's like if you're at a restaurant and they have a bunch of food that they offer, they're not going to tell you every individual item that they offer. They're going to hand you a menu. And that's kind of what we do with the templates here. So I made a template uh, specifically for today. I just called it a snow removal template. At my company, prior to selling it, we, we had basically three main templates. We had a summer only template, a winter only template, and a full year template. Because we had a lot of customers that would just do a full year package that we would maybe break into installment payments. Uh, for today's example, we're keeping it really, really um, simple and primarily just a commercial plowing quote. So when I hit that template, it brings in all my predetermined services that are related to the, the, um, the commercial snow quote that we need to prepare. And I know there's probably a lot of data here and I know it might be a little small on the screen. So I'll kind of break it down by line item um, just so we can really understand what's going on here. But the first thing you'll see here is a part of a snow plowing and parking lot salting package. And I know a lot of people in the states, in the northern states, they offer their, especially commercial snow removal by the depth of snow. It's actually not as common in Canada. Actually not common in New York either, but it would be considered uh, most areas per push per inch. Uh, so that is usually one of the biggest questions we get, Dylan. Um, maybe you can break down some context of how we did that. But the ability is they actually have to select from zero to two, two to three, four, four to six, six to eight, and then maybe eight to 10, and then 10 inches and beyond is an hourly rate. But it gives you the ability to actually um, present that, but the consumer has to click and accept all the terms, just not the ones they want. And that's where we get in, uh, you know, in some sticky situations if we don't have this set up correctly. So we're going to utilize a package and combine that right in there. Yeah, and I've seen people run into a lot of issues where they'll set each of those depths up as services and then they'll send the quote out to the customer. And if I'm the customer, I'm thinking, well, I'm I'm just going to take the cheapest service that you're presenting me here. Why would I pay, in this example, 455 bucks and wait for you to come until there's six inches of snow when I can get you at two inches for 247? So you need to present it in a package and I'll show you how this actually looks to the customer. But that is a very important element here if you are quoting by depth. If you're just quoting a flat rate for regardless of the depth, it's actually um, considerably easier than this, but this is a nifty kind of workaround with Service Autopilot. So like you said, the customer doesn't have the option to choose what depth they want the service at. Um, so the important thing here is for each one of these line items in the package, it is connected to that measurement that we just took. So that, you know, roughly two acres um, of plowable surface, that's referenced right here. And then it also is bringing in the appropriate rate, um, the amount of budgeted time that we need to get this service done in if we win this job. And then how much this is actually costing the company. And this is a big point of contention, I feel like with a lot of people in the service autopilot ecosystem is like, what should this cost actually represent? And there's a little wiggle room there to, to what you actually want that to be, but uh, I think I could speak for, for Mike as well, where we like to represent your actual true cost to perform this service instead of just the rate you're charging for the service minus how much you might be paying Jimmy to go plow this lot. Your numbers are probably going to look pretty good there, but when you start to bring in things like overhead and other things like that, that's where some people kind of get surprised that they might not be making quite as much money as they thought they were originally. Did I do yeah, that? Great point, Dylan. Yeah, you did, did it justice. That's uh, so be your net bottom line profit is what we're projecting. Uh, we do work with a couple um, uh, equity groups that buy companies in the service industry. They've actually joined up, up with us to have them have us. Uh, set up their acquisitions in here. And some of the equity groups we work with uh, will be looking at gross margin as well, uh, somewhere in that 50 to 55% net in like landscape services and maintenance. Uh, that can also be built in there. Uh, but if you're not necessarily reporting out to a venture capital board uh, based on margin and painting that story, um, I would say expert opinion with Dylan and myself um, is we want to represent our bet bottom line net projected profit. And uh, the gentleman, uh, the main gentleman working with one of these equity groups um, 
also agreed, you know, if you didn't want to paint that picture to an investment board, that you probably would want to, if you're a normal operation, uh, looking to eventually retire or get acquired, that's the bottom line number you actually want to project in that um, thing. But there is some flexibility if you're looking at gross margin as well. And most people are unaware of that. Yeah. I mean, if, if I had the option between the two costs, I want to see my true cost to perform the service, not well, what's, the, what's the price minus the labor. That doesn't tell the, the entire story. Yeah, especially with the overhead and the salt and everything else destroying the equipment, you want to make sure that uh, you've got those costs associated in there. Yep, exactly. So basically, it breaks it down per level of snow. So we got zero to two, two point one to four, et cetera, et cetera, and then over six is one hundred and fifty dollars per hour. Once again, I'll show you how this um, looks on the the customer end, but I also opted to include parking lot salting in this. Uh, package as well, because not many people that I know, especially in the commercial world, are going to do just plowing and leave the parking lot really icy, open to tons of liability. And the opposite is true. Not many people are going to go and just sand. It's usually a combo package of the two. Is that kind of how you offered your services, Mike? Uh, we offered it both ways. Okay. Um, traditionally, you want to control the salt of the de-icing as well. So we would pretty much require it. But if there was the one off that didn't want it. A um, couple of the bigger franchises like McDonald's and things like that uh, wouldn't opt for it. Uh, but there was a very, very hefty uh, non, or basically a uh, hold harmless yeah. for slip and fall litigation. I'm sure you're going to get into at the end of this, uh, the ability in service autopilot to get an electronic signature with a time and date stamped IP address on the actual quote itself. So that's going to be something very important that uh, you want to include whether you're not, you're putting the, the ice melts in that and it's a package required. But if you're not salting or sanding, uh, you definitely want to make sure that 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 liability is relinquished on that contract um chris mcclear clear he's got a question here live uh what's up chris buddy uh question how to figure out your cost per hour when you don't know the amount of hours during the winter so chris what we're gonna do is take an average so traditionally we took 17 to 20 years uh in my market upstate new york rochester it's actually the third largest snowfall market in the whole united states lakeside we're averaging 130 to about 133 inches um, so what you're going to do is, is go out and reverse engineer that over 17 to 20 years, uh, in our market, a three inch trigger on residential was running between 17 and, uh, 20 visits. Uh, we projected that a little bit higher, uh, when we had a, a, a pretty good string of winters, uh, capping that around 22 to 23 visits at a three inch trigger for residential driveways and then commercial, uh, about 65 salt runs and sidewalk runs and then plowing was somewhere between 35 and 40. Um, and then any snow removal or stacking was based on a three hour minimum with a loader, three hours per minute for a loader, and I believe three three hours minimum for a six wheel dump as well. Um, that was pre-signed and approved beforehand. But uh, uh, Chris, obviously there's not a crystal ball. If you're looking at it, it's um, I'm looking at it right here. It's called Limit Risk with Diversification, Lawn and Landscape Magazine. A couple of years ago, if you look in the little search bar, I break the exact percentages and how we actually did just that in your question. And our net pro bottom line profit was in three, three to five percent every year over about 15 to 20 years. Um, and that's kind of unheard in the snow industry. But that's how we take those averages and de-risk it and then be able to average those costs um, on an average year. And I mean, I know I know Chris. Chris is not not too far away from Sudbury. Um You've been operating for a while. I mean, even if you used your last three to five years, whatever you have the best data on, um, you have the actual figures of how many hours you and your guys worked. Um, so I would kind of use that as your baseline. Yeah. And if you could find some industry data, you know, that's going to be great too. But best you could do is with, with, with the data that you have, and then each year, you know, get a little bit better at tracking it and kind of adjust that average as you go. But I know you've got pretty, pretty good data, so that shouldn't be too, too hard for you to, to figure out how many hours were actually worked last winter. Awesome. Great insight there on it as well, Dylan. Um, so at the end of this, uh, first package for the, uh, actual plowing and the parking lot salting, you'll notice I have one thing checked off here and that is just an additional, um, item. If it's a really small lot and maybe you're going to use a tailgate salter, what I would do is I was, I would actually uncheck this parking lot salting and use this parking lot salting. This one that I have checked off here is, is just kind of like the default one where we're actually using about a five cubic yard, um, basically box salter. And then this one is a tailgate spreader. So 
as you would probably expect, we're going to be charging a little bit more for the same area if we're using a tailgate spreader. It's just going to take a little bit longer. And therefore, we're going to have a little bit more budgeted time allocated to that service. And it's going to cost the company a little bit more on the, on the cost section as well. But for this size of a parking lot, almost two acres, we would definitely be using the, the bigger sun turbine. Um, the next package that we have is for the shoveling and the sidewalk ice control. So once again, if, if, you, if you will just do shoveling or you will just do sidewalk salting, then you'd probably want to break this out. But at least in my market, you weren't doing either or. It was, we're either doing the entire thing or we're not taking on the liability. So we would actually have a shoveling rate and then an ice melt application rate. And you'll notice this is based off of like 3,072 square feet. So not the parking lot square feet, but the actual sidewalk square feet that we measured. So it's coming in about 155 bucks a visit for the shoveling uh, and 1.92 man hours. Um, so that's actually not too far off. There would be some pretty nasty drifts along that side of that building. So with, with two guys, they were there for about 45 minutes typically. So this is actually very, very close, even though it's kind of fictitious numbers. And then the sidewalk um, salting is 125 in application. So is that all making sense so far? Making sense to me. Once you quote those, is there uh, down on the bottom, is that projecting your your time your time and your costs then? Profits? So let me, if we're good with all those figures, let me select all and hit quote here. And hard to see, but obviously you can you can just kind of confirm that, that that's on there. Yep. So we got the the revenue, and, and this is um, this isn't necessarily the best way to look at this for for this particular quote because we are presenting it in such a unique way for the customer, where it's not like a lawn mowing quote where it's like, hey, we're going twenty five times. The cut price is a hundred bucks a cut, so your your revenue for the season is X. Yep. Um, we're, we're presenting, we're kind of manipulating the system to be able to quote it in a very unique way for this particular service. Perfect. I'm glad you, I was kind of where I was hoping to lead you, but that was kind of where I was going. But perfect. Yeah. All right. But so yeah, there is ways to do that in the system. Uh, very similar if you want to do high-low pricing with spring and fall cleanups. Uh, right. There's ways to manipulate those packages to kind of protect yourself as the business owner. Yep. So the next thing is you want to be able to have like a templated email that you're sending out when you're quoting this. You don't want to have to type something out. And I know for the service autopilot folks, that probably seems um, pretty basic, but I actually got a little example. I'll show in just a second. So I'm gonna hit email here. And here's the just the default template that we have when we're showing people how the, the system works. Um, so this is all gonna fill in when I actually send this out. I'm gonna throw in my email here just so we can actually uh, see it. Yeah, but the cool thing, Dylan, while you're doing this, this is automatically load. So you can set your marketing copy and delegate it to anybody on your team, whether it's a salesperson, admin, virtual assistant, somebody like Pink Collars or Call Boss. Um, so this is really, it, it's pretty cool how once this is set up, it's a turnkey delegatable thing. And if you're using that satellite imagery with that built, uh, the business owner doesn't have to be involved in this process. And that's uh, literally this tool is what me allowed me to become an absentee owner, Dylan. And this is um, obviously the same tool. I'm assuming that this this process allowed you to actually sell uh, your business um, and actually join the Simple Growth team. And little known fact, J uh, Dylan was actually our first client at Simple Growth using Service Autopilot. So um, we've come full circle here. So yeah, no, this this system definitely helped a ton. And part part of it was what I'm showing here, but part of it was also just like the automations and being able to follow up on these quotes. Um, I know what I said when I when I hit email here and having a templated email that goes out is, is pretty commonplace for the service autopilot realm, but it's, believe it or not, it's actually not that commonplace outside of what we take for granted. Um, in our neighborhood here, actually, I requested a quote and there, there's a major advantage to even if someone just calls in and gets a quote to actually putting it in the system like this and sending it out even if you don't have automations to follow up on it, just so there actually is a record of it. Um, I, I kind of whited out everything so we, so we can't necessarily see anything, but this was me asking for an email or, or asking for a quote, sorry, via email. And there was no official quote actually sent back to me. It was just a quick email that, that got sent off to me. Now, like, what do you think are the chances that I 
get followed up on if I don't respond to this email? I'm guessing slim to none. You might have a better chance of that guy snow blowing your snow, your driveway there with a uh, snow blower. It's electric with a cord is my guess, but I'm just throwing that out there. They neither here nor there. You might have a better chance of that. You're right. Um, <laughs> even our biggest competitor in Sudbury, um, who was like way better funded than us, they did the same thing as this. And I couldn't believe it because yes, you might be getting inundated with quote requests and this is the only way you can kind of keep your head above water. But I mean, you, you lose the ability to follow up. And I know you, you talk about this quite frequently, but you're not going to close hundred percent of your people on the first contact with them. Sometimes, you know, at least two is, is necessary, right? I might not get back to this person. And if they don't follow up with me, I'm not going to go with them. Yeah, statistically, it's actually five or more touches to close 80% of the sales in your market. Um, and, and actually, I think it's almost quicker to use the pre-templated stuff, uh, but this levels the playing field. So if you're a smaller company looking to grow and scale, um, it allows you to compete with the larger companies and actually beat them. Um, but if you're another, if you're a company million and beyond, this allows you to save sometimes 20 to 30 hours a week in the office of unnecessary overhead and you can allow those people in your office to do more higher level stuff. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. And uh, I just threw this together today. So I, I think I must've just had the grid lines on, but this is basically what the customer would actually see minus the grid lines. Um, so all those items and all that costing and budgeted hour information, of course, they don't see that, but instead they're going to see this snow plowing and lot salting package. Well, what's included in the package? Well, here's the cost for snow plowing at this depth, at this depth, at this depth. And then this is the hourly price if it's just a, a crazy storm and we're coming and plowing a foot or half a foot of snow. And then here's the parking lot salting price. It's so like, like we said earlier, we're not giving them the option to choose which one they want. That would be absolute mayhem trying to manage that. They're instead having to agree to the entire bundle because we don't know how much snow is going to fall in, you know, with the couple hours before they wake up. Um, the next package here is the shoveling and ice control package where we have the sidewalk shoveling for 155 a visit and then the salt application um, for 125. So they would ideally agree to both. And you would actually put your contract terms here. Now, this is just fictitious um, wording here. I didn't want to put any actual real contract terms. This is but, where that whole harmless in terms of service would actually go. Yep. And a lot of people don't know that you can have your contract in your estimate in service autopilot. Even I've talked to some people, believe it or not, where they're sending out the estimate, they're getting it approved, and then they're sending them like a Word document or something to actually, or a PDF to sign their contract. Ideally, you want to have these both in one, and you can make it look really, really professional as well. Um, so I kept a couple of Mike's videos here because I think they'd be pretty, pretty applicable. Who's that guy? Uh, top nine questions asked when hiring a snow contractor and how our snow services work. So Dylan, those are actually videos from my company that we embedded inside the online estimate. People could actually watch that. So that's 24 hours, seven days a week. So um if you haven't been to a service autopilot conference, uh, one of the, the keynotes, Marcus Sheridan had been there at least twice, and he has a book called They Ask, You Answer. Marcus is doing the same thing in river pools and spas that we were doing in Callahan's Lawn Care. So uh, if you want to set yourself apart, the ability to do some videos there uh, about your snow removal company that play live inside your essence is definitely a great way to go. Yeah, and if you're struggling for content, I mean, you can – search this video or just ask your office, what are the common questions you're getting 24 seven? I guarantee they will have a list of questions that they're repeating on a daily basis. And that's just what you want to put in there. Exactly. So I took it one step further because um, a lot of people will say, well, I can send it to them and they can sign it. But like a lot of people want my signature on there as well. So I actually just found a random signature online, but you can actually basically pre-sign these estimates that you're, you're sending out. And then the client is going to sign here, but then at least on the signed agreement, you have the client signature and your signature, and it's a totally binding contract. Great advice. Love it. So they would, you know, look at the pricing. They'd come down here. They'd click to sign the proposal. They would sign their life away, hit save, uh, print their name, and then hit accept proposal. 
And that would basically alert your office that we have an accepted estimate. So I'll let this load for just a second. And it lets the client know that you know they've successfully accepted the proposal. And at this point, if I was going about my day and I saw, excuse me, that acceptance come in, I could come back into uh, this file here. And I'll give it just a second. And I'll actually show you where the estimate basically signed contract is is actually saved in their file. Yeah, and that's a great tool there, Dylan, too, which is that you get the, the time date stamped IP address mm -hmm. as well as the electronic signature you can print out. So uh, it didn't happen often, but every once in a while you would get a potential lawsuit for a slip and fall um, or a contract um, yep. challenge. And I will tell you, at least in the States, that's a slam dunk. Uh, you present that and all, most of your issues disappear unless it's complete negligence. Yep, 100%. Same thing in Canada. So you have the basic signature information um, over here. And you might think that's a little weird, like IP address. I want to see their actual signature. Um, so basically under the attachments tab right here, the minute that they sign that proposal, it's automatically saved to, to the file here. So if I click on that, it'll bring up the proposal and it'll actually have their signature down here. You know, we have their name, the date and the client signature and all the contractor signatures here. So this is a, basically an executed agreement at this point. Yeah, it works great. We did it on some real big ones. Yep. Um, yeah. And it's professional. It's quick. Speed wins right now. And that, that's the key to it. Yep, exactly. And I mean, I hear a lot of people just still printing out contracts, going and getting them signed, you know, scanning two copies, sending one to them, uploading one to service autopilot when really that can all be done in the system. My, my favorite is a three-part carbon copy with the scan. It's, it's it's time time to go digital and your office will thank you. Yep. So in it, for the sake of time here, um, we're going to have to skip basically a step. But from here, we can actually now schedule these services. So I'll exit out of here. And earlier today, I just kind of went through and actually scheduled. Because really, there's four parts to this contract, right? There's the plowing the lot sanding, um, the shoveling, and then the sidewalk salting. And those might not all be done by the same person. Probably not. I would hope not. Um, so that's why it is important to have them all separated out. See, a lot of people just say, oh, commercial plowing. And, oh, that includes plowing, sanding, or salting uh, the sidewalks because we do the sidewalks everywhere. And that might work if you're, like, very, very small. But eventually you're going to have probably a totally different crew um, doing the sidewalks and you want to have that flexibility in case you do need to have someone else doing that truck going down no call no show employee somebody stuck in a snowbank the list goes on and on yep. if, if you've been in this long enough oh for sure so once these services are scheduled there's one extra step uh, before we can actually dispatch these jobs and and really track the profitability on these jobs and that's actually the creation of a master route. So this is what is going to, it takes a little bit of time to set up, but this is what allowed me to dispatch basically 30 crews in 10, 15 seconds. Um, like it, 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 once they're perfected, it, it literally takes a matter of seconds to, to dispatch all of your jobs. So you're saying a little upfront time pays big dividends when the stress of that snow is uh, coming in. You've got that anxiety and you're kind of staring out the window, waiting to see what happens. Yep. And if you're having any trouble setting up these master routes, there's a couple of help videos, but just reach out to us too and, and we can help because there's kind of a couple weird steps. I'll, I'll click into one here and just show. Obviously, we, I just got uh, the one. The one yeah, we part. get uh, SEC 2022 Service Edge Conference in November as well. Dylan and I, uh, yep. Dan in Virginia, who also ran a Cape Cod tree and lawn with snow down in Cape Cod, as well as Service Autopilot's going to have a uh, their their uh, help area as well in there, uh, open the whole conference. So there's definitely a lot of need-to-need uh, -need opportunity if people are there live. Yep. So basically, each asset that you have, you want to have a route for that asset. Um, now, that doesn't mean that asset can only do one type of service, like plowing. Our plow trucks would typically have a sander in the back of them. And because we didn't really salt parking lots up in uh, Northern Ontario, it would do the plowing and the parking lot salting or sanding. So I would typically call my routes anyways, plowing and then the asset number. So for simplicity's sake today, truck one, 
And then we basically tell it what services could this person do? And you got to be careful here because if you said, I'm just going to select all my snow services, well, then you're basically telling the system, hey, this plow truck one can also do snow shoveling, sidewalk salting, which just isn't the case, right? You want it to be the core services that this asset is actually going to do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm glad you dove into that because that usually is the biggest uh, mistake. And I, as a rookie user, the first year I made the same mistake. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Okay, perfect. So once those master routes are ready to go, and you know, there's a little bit of manipulation up until you reach your where you're maxed out and you've hit your capacity, then your routes are basically set for basically the entire year. And you don't really need to touch those master routes. Once those master routes are perfected, then you can actually come into the uh, snow dispatch board. And you'll see here, I already have some, some jobs from earlier today so that we can actually see how these look on the report. But I'll just, I won't actually do it, but I'll show you the steps on how to actually get these in here. And you would actually go to add. To if you're watching this channel too, and you're wondering why you don't have uh, snow on there, we need to have service autopilot and activate on-demand jobs. And those jobs themselves on the service level need to have a little checkbox showing snow dispatch. So if you're, you're watching along with us here at home or at the office and you don't see it, um, hit up SA's chat support and they'll be able to turn that on for you. Yep. And there's a lot of steps here, but once you go through it once or twice, it, it becomes like second nature. So I'm actually just going to make a new snow dispatch and I'll just say it's, um, you know, a test. And you would go add to dispatch. And because your master routes are perfected and they're in the order that you want to actually perform those jobs, why I said you can dispatch, I, I don't care, 100 routes in one second is your job now is to come in here and check all. And you can say how much snow there actually is or how much snow you're anticipating. So I'll put one here. And I know it's a little, a little hard to see, but I did put a one right here. And I'll hit search. So is that searching a trigger depth then? Well, it's searching all of the jobs associated with any of the clients on your master routes. So if you have those master routes set up, like I said, this is actually very easy to look at because we're only looking at four services for one client. But you could have thousands and thousands of jobs here. You don't need to review this list because all of this has been pre-set up. So I wanted to put one here in the trigger inches just to show that when I set these services up, I told the system the plowing and the sidewalk shoveling is a two inch trigger. Mm. So you're like the system's pretty much warning you, like, do you, are you sure you really want to dispatch these jobs? Because you just told me there's only one inch of snow. So I'm going to put it to two just for simplicity's sake here. And That's I'm a good gonna, point, because we on ours we had zero tolerance was like we put that at like 0.25, and then we had one inch triggers, two inch triggers, and three inch triggers. So this allowed us to sort through those jobs uh, where I said we had about 180 acres of payment. That was if it was a full run. You might be only doing maybe 50 or 60 acres on just sidewalk runs and salting, yep. potentially. And I believe that's where the show exclusions um, comes into play, but. For for this example, right, let's pretend there's two inches of snow on the ground or potentially going to be on the ground. And we search the two master routes. But like I said, it doesn't matter if you have 2, 20 or 200. Your job then would basically be coming in here and hitting add to dispatch. Now, before you do that, if you'd like, you could put in the temperature and you could put in the depth. But um, I'll, I'll put in uh, two inches here. And I do believe it's been a while since I've done this personally, but I believe you can add that in later too, if you want. You, you yeah. can. And why I said you can kind of, you don't need to do that right now is because it, it basically will ask you to confirm the billing depth before you actually close out the, the dispatch. So I won't do this necessarily because we, we already have another dispatch running, but that's the extent of you having to actually dispatch all your jobs, whether you got one crew or a thousand. It's pretty quick once it's set up. So. I'm going to hit cancel here and I'm going to go back to the dispatch that I had open earlier. And these are the four jobs for this one client that we've been working with. Um, so in this example, they're actually already done, but I'm going to pretend we've already had the storm. We've actually dispatched these jobs and our crew has actually uh, performed them. 
So I'm going to have to zoom, or I guess not zoom out. I'll just come over here. So I've selected the closeout day option right here, just so that we can see. And, you know, I put these times in fictitiously. But your start and stop times, correct? When you actually did the job. And the, correct. These are the start and stop times of the person actually performing this job. So you'll notice here, and I'm going to bring in one more column that we got actual hours. So you notice when I actually schedule these jobs, and this came from the data on the estimate, um, I put in basically all, all these jobs totaled 3.06 budgeted hours. So if we're going to send one person to do them, they should have got this job done in 3.06 hours. So you can see here, the first one is the parking lot salting and the plowing. And this was the time that it took for that. So, or this was the, what we were budgeting, sorry. And this was the actual time. So I guess the salting, it looks like went a little quicker and the plowing took a little longer. And then for the shoveling and the um, sidewalk salting, you'll notice we are budgeting 1.44 hours for the shoveling and it actually ended up taking 2.1 hours. So that's a fairly large discrepancy. Tim Hortons break right there. Got to eat those munchkins. P potentially. Um, out there. And then for the salting, we were budgeting 0.45 of a man hour, and it actually took 0.63. So if I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, uh, looks like the, the plower and the person who was salting the parking lot did a pretty good job, but it looks like we might have some issues here. And it's not necessarily the employee. Maybe we just bid this property totally wrong, right? Which is the importance of actually looking at this data and especially being able to look at it at the end of a month or at the end of the season and say, did were we incorrect in any of our properties? Because if all the other properties are good and it's just this property, you, you kind of know what your issue is. It was just we underbid this property. But if you find it's one uh, crew leader, basically, that's causing all the issues, well, it becomes very simple to isolate uh, your issues. But the last thing I kind of wanted to show you is a report. And there's a really important reason why you should be looking at things on a report and not just the dispatch board here. This is pretty easy to look at with four jobs, but picture you had 400 jobs here. You trying to look at the totals up here to figure out what's going on. It, they could be identical for all I care. It could be 3.06 and 3.06 or let's say 300 and 300. And you're like, well, hey, we beat the, or we met the time. That's great, right? Well, kind of the devil could be in the details where one crew could be overperforming and doing an amazing job. And one crew could literally be messing your entire profitability up, but you wouldn't be able to tell with just this. And you're probably not gonna wanna look at every single line item to determine where are we going wrong or how could we improve? So the last step of this is setting up some key reports. And ideally, you want these to be automated and to be sending to you on like a daily, weekly, or a monthly basis. But let's just pretend they're even not automated and you got to come in here to the report center and look at them. There is a really big benefit to actually um, looking at it in the, in the report center. So I'll kind of break down what we're seeing here, but I have it broken down per crew. So for this storm, I told Mike he's got a got a shovel and salt, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in the plow truck. Brutal. And you can see the date. You can see how many people are on the crew. Obviously, just one. The the client name, the address, the service actually performed, and then the start and stop times. So just like what we were looking at on the dispatch board, you're gonna see the budgeted hours, the actual hours. And you can pull up the time variance on the dispatch board too. But this is the first point where I normally pause and I say, if you're just looking at this on the dispatch board, these types of things are not gonna jump out at you like they will on a report. So I've actually set up basically a variable on this report to highlight in red if we're over a certain amount of time. And I think I put maybe 0.2 of a, of a man hour or, or 0.15 of a man hour. So this one kind of just registered, but that's a pretty significant amount. I mean, what is 0.15 times 60 minutes? Guessing around 12 minutes is my guess. 
Oh, you're you're a little off. Nine nine minutes. Uh, mental math sounds you on a Friday. Nine minutes times you know thirty or forty visits potentially in a season, that does add up. Um, so that's kind of like my minimum threshold where I don't want to be worried if someone goes two minutes over. That's not even worth my time to look at. But if someone's consistently going 10 minutes over, 20 minutes, 30 minutes over, I definitely want to know about that. And once again, you don't make any rash decisions, but you're like, hmm, OK, I'm, I got to keep an eye on this property on the next storm to see if this trend continues. Um, so the next thing that we're pulling in here is the actual revenue. And I basically pulled in another thing here just to show you that when we quoted uh, the sidewalk salting and the parking lot salting, it was just like the all in rate, um, including you know labor materials, things like that. But if you wanna get really granular with it and actually track how much products are being used, I basically set it up in the system so that the person plowing or the person doing the sidewalks would be able to enter in how much salt did they use? It wouldn't affect the price because we've already arranged that with the customer, but it's what we need for the actual accurate job costing here. So in this fictitious example, the plower, which was me, entered in that I used one ton of salt. So that was $60 in this example. And I think this one was uh, four bags of salt at $10 a bag. You know, once again, just just kind of fictitious, but that is important to basically take out of the revenue, because if we were to look at the plowing and just say how much it, or, or the salting and say, how much is this person in bring, bringing in per man hour? It's going to be like an astronomical amount because the product cost is included in there. So I actually would minus out the product cost from here so that we can see what is the gross margin on this service. And then like we said earlier, we actually are also interested in what is the total cost, including the overhead, and what is the net profit on this job? Gross margin is one thing, but we do wanna see the net profit. Um, I also brought in a column here called gross margin per man hour. And that's basically subtracting out the product cost. How much are these people bringing in per man hour for these services? So it looks like I was actually bringing in 655 bucks per man hour because the salting, even minus the product cost, is still astronomical. And Mike is only bringing in a measly 76.19 per man hour. And there was one service here that's actually under our 60 per hour minimum threshold. So the system basically automatically highlighted that in red as well. Is that kind of making sense from, from left to right, Mike? Makes complete sense. I love the non-emotional data reporting. You forgot to mention that, uh, you know, given my height, it's kind of hard to get up and get the rest of those drifts off the side of the building. Maybe I was a little, little vertically challenged on those, but yeah, that, that that's actually all kidding aside that that is, uh, that really is what, what is going to drive those non-emotional abilities to see where you're winning and losing. Some of those crews are going to be bleeding dry and some are going to be winning, just like Dylan said. Um, but now we can go in before we renew those contracts and run some reports and see if our goal is 150 an hour. Um, what do we need to charge to hit it on average? So yeah. awesome, awesome work here, Dylan. Love it. Yeah. Especially with like those commercial shoveling crews where you might have two or three guys, maybe even four guys in a truck going around and, and doing things. You really got to be looking at how much that crew is bringing in on a per man hour basis. Um, whether you're doing summer work or winter work, but this report, like you said, will make it non-emotional and kind of just summarize the data. So even if you have 30 crews, it's like, I'm looking at 30 things on this report rather than trying to make sense of, you know, 400 jobs on the dispatch. Love it, brother. Could have done it better myself. Appreciate it. Any other closing thoughts there on that? Uh, that's basically like the stem to stern setup of a commercial job in service autopilot. So I guess if anybody has any questions, um, I'm sure Mike will put some info in the comments, but otherwise just reach out to Simple Growth uh, on the Facebook page and we'd be happy to help. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome work. We'll see you again next week uh, on the Service Autopilot page and the Simple Growth page for the SA Weekly Talk Show.